Welcome to Mr. Carlson's lab. Today we're going to restore a radio receiver from 1939. We're going to make it perform the way it did when it rolled off the factory line. This should be a lot of fun. In the end, we'll try it out and see how well it performs. So you'll get a really good idea of what this radio sounded like way back when. Let's get started. Here is our Westinghouse electrical restoration project for the day. As you can see, the cabinet itself is in original condition. It's never been refinished. It even has the original lettering and numbering on it. I'll zoom you in so that you can see this here. Now, it really is quite common for people over time to drag their fingernails on the finish and take all of this off. But somebody or a bunch of people, however many you know, hands or owners this has been through, has been very careful with this thing and nothing has happened here. So that is definitely original and it hasn't been put on there again. You can see a bit of wear in the paper inserts in the buttons. You can see the two buttons that were pushed the most. So as you can see, you push the buttons and it gives you your pre-tuned stations. Not bad. The tuning is nice and smooth. The switches feel pretty positive still. So all in all, not bad. The case itself, all of these old radios for some reason are white overspray magnets. If you've been restoring any of these older wooden radios, you'll know exactly what I mean. So they attract I don't know, little white overspray dots everywhere. All of them seem to do that, I guess in the you know, 80 plus years that this thing has been around. You know, somebody has sprayed white paint in somewhere around this. Now, I'm not going to even bother trying to take that off because it will destroy the finish. It is so incredibly light on this one little area that it's not even worth tackling. So we'll just call that patina and leave that alone. The little scratches on the side are a very, very easy fix. I will show you that. And this radio will look very, very close to new. So let me tell you, I had to warm up the cathodes in the time machine just a little hotter to find one this nice. So I'll get this thing turned around and we'll take a look at the backside. The backside of the radio is in very nice condition. We can see that it has been stored in a climate controlled area. There's just dust. There really is no rust on the chassis. All the original stickers seem to be intact, which is nice. Now, again, the date on this is a little bit up in the air. That's why I say 80 plus years. It could be 1938. It could be 1939. The last date on this little, uh, piece of paper here that they've stapled in is 1938. So, you know, I'm saying 1939 to be safe. I would say that's a nice safe bet. This is the 785. You'll see schematics and, um, you know, basic alignment procedure that says 41, 42 on it, I believe. Yes, it's 41 and 42 on it. The, uh, that is for the A and the X version. So that is a much later version than this. So we'll have to match the schematic up with this. I really doubt that I'm going to need a schematic to service this thing anyways, but we'll take a look at it and see what they've done and get the idea of what their thought process was when they put this thing together. Speaker's in very nice condition. The line cord is absolutely toast. It's just, as I'm doing this, it's breaking and falling on the bench here. So there would be no way to power this thing up to even try it out you know, if we even wanted to right now. So that cord has to go first. Uh, the standard antenna that's put around the frame of the unit here, way back in the 30s and 40s, AM radio stations were basically flamethrowers and they had lots and lots of power. So you didn't need much of an antenna to receive anything AM. Nowadays, you know, unless you're close to a, a radio station or you have, you know, I guess you could say not very many switch mode power supplies in your house. Uh, you might actually be able to hear something on this, but uh, when we try this out in the end, what I'll end up doing is hook this up to an external antenna that goes outside that's away from all the switch mode power supply noise and everything that's uh, that's in the area here. And that's everything nowadays is is built with nice small transformers and switch mode power supplies, not transformers like this that run at 25 cycles. So this will operate at 25 or 60 cycles, this transformer. And it's even rated right here. I don't know if I can zoom you into that so you can see that. 25 or 60 cycles. So this will run at some pretty, uh, at a pretty low line frequency. Nice big core on that transformer right there. So the next thing to do is to get this thing out and it's not too big of a deal. Just have to pull the knobs off and remove some screws in here and uh, then we'll have to remove the speaker as well. We'll get into the chassis and see what we're up against. First step is to remove the knobs on the face of the unit. 
nice little felt pad under there, which is nice. It's, makes me even wonder if this thing has ever even been serviced in its life. This one here doesn't want to come off. There we go. Even the knobs come off relatively easy. So this is definitely a first try, so no. Yeah, that's just amazing. That one isn't missing, or this one doesn't have the felt, so the felt is missing here, which is uh, kind of interesting. So maybe that has been off. A little bit of oxidization on that one. So that's all that needs to be done on the front side. Everything else can be left alone, and we'll go to the back side, remove the screws now, and then this chassis should just come right out. I don't know if you can see up inside here, but it doesn't look like they've put a screw in that front mount. And that could be factory. So is it would be relatively hard to get at those way up front. So they may have only done these two rear ones here. So the first thing that needs to be done is we'll remove this on the back. So that's the antenna. And there's a plug here for the speaker. We'll unplug that. And we'll grab a screwdriver here. Undo this. It is pretty tight, so that is really in there. That really is in there. I think that's some oxidization on the screws that's actually making it like that, because it should not be that incredibly tight. And we'll get to the other side here. There's definitely got to be some oxidization on these. Oh, that one wasn't too bad. That was a lot easier than the other one, that's for sure. Now I got to get the line cord out of here so it doesn't get all tangled up. Look at that. Look at that outlet. That definitely looks like that could be original. And maybe somebody had some extra antenna wire to string outside at some time. Some nice antique wire there. Okay, so let's push this a little bit forward and see if this will slide out. There it is. There it is. So what I'll do is I'll just get this out of the way, slide this forward, and we'll take a closer look at the chassis. Other than a whole lot of dust, it's looking pretty good. So that'll have to be taken outside and I will use some compressed air to clean that off. The actual face of the unit is in pretty good condition as well. So let's tip this around here. Again, just needing, you know, a bit of de-dusting. I-tube in the center here. I wonder how strong that is. That would be a good indication if this radio has been used a lot. Boy, that line cord is something else. That thing is just chunky. What I'm going to do is grab a pair of clippers and just get rid of that right now. This is just crazy. It's like glass. I can see this here. It's just like glass. Have a little bit of sweeping to do here in a little bit. So that is that's a pretty pretty crusty line cord right there. Probably one of the worst that I've seen actually. That's really really dried up. So now in order to get onto the underside here, oh, look at this, there's an actual schematic right on the bottom. Isn't that nice? So we don't, we don't even need to, uh, just put that carefully like so for a moment. We don't even need to look at the, uh, the other schematic diagram. It's so nice when they do this. Now this one here is the W785A-X and it says tentative schematic diagram. So interesting, this could be 19, this is the, is this the A-X? So yeah, this d definitely is a, a the A-X here. So this is 4142, but the date inside is 38. So maybe they carried it through. So we'll have to take a look at that piece of paper. 
you know, beyond this piece of paperwork right here and the piece of paperwork on the bottom side of the chassis, so this, which is basically a tube layout map, and it also has the trimmer locations with the IF frequency and everything and the schematic on the bottom, we really don't need any other paperwork to align and completely restore this radio. They've included everything we need right in the radio itself. Isn't that nice? So now what tells me this is 1938, 1939 roughly, is we can see the last date here is 1938. And in Canada, way back in the day, you had to have a license to own one of these radios. And they had to be relatively up to date with that act. And as you can see right here, it also says 1938. So I would say safely 38 or 39. And uh, you know, it's a pretty stern warning right here. If you wanna read that, you can pause the video and read that if you like. So what I'll do is I'll get the cabinet moved around and we'll get the speaker out of this thing. What I normally like to do is take the bottom screws out first, the ones that are the hardest to get at. Now you gotta be very careful with this. You wanna be careful that the screwdriver does not slip and you end up going through the paper in the speaker. These older speakers are magnets for that. I've mentioned this so many times in my other videos. If you're going to slip with your screwdriver, chances are it's going to go through the paper. So there's another one down here, right down in there that I need to get at. So you gotta be very careful. Have lots of control over this screwdriver. And then remove it as soon as I can. So that's nice and loose. So I'll just get that out of there and then remove the rest of it with my fingers. Might even be able to remove that on, from the bottom side a little bit easier. You see that? Your fingers can kind of get up through there. Again, these, uh, this paper is so fragile now. The speakers still sound absolutely fine, but uh, the, you know, the, of course the paper from all these years is nice and dry. So it's always better just to be careful. So I have to put my hand under here like so. And one more to go. Again, always leave the easiest ones to get to for last. Let's hold that steady and carefully lift this up and out. And we sure wouldn't want to damage that, would we? Let's see what we are up against. Move all these screws. Nice design way back when. They really didn't cut corners. This really added to stability in the circuitry inside. Everything was nicely shielded. Down the road, oh, it's missing a screw over here. Down the road, they really, you know, all of these radio manufacturers started to cut corners and, you know, started to cheap out. A lot of them, they would put an asbestos sheet under this instead of having a bottom on this and doing things like that. So it's kind of nice to see, you know, this early stuff, it was really just, it just screams quality, right? So you can see this, there's a bunch more screws here. They've put something on the inside. Remember what I said about quality. This is a, going a little bit overboard, it looks like. So maybe this side is either part of it or something. It looks like the side panels are part of the bottom case, which is a little bit odd. It's always nice to discover this together. Each one of these things is put together just a little bit differently, you know. Okay, so I'll turn this, yeah, now it's loose, that's for sure. Okay, so we'll turn this back upside down again so we can get a good view of what's going on carefully. And here we go. Whoa, look at that. So it has been serviced. Where is the clue? Can you see it? Right here. So it has been serviced over time and I'm trying to see what they've done here for anything else that's in here. It looks like it's all pretty much original. This looks like it's gotten extremely hot. I'll zoom you in a bit. And the wax has just come right off of this. And that's pretty common for something that's tied right to the chassis, right? We have our main filter can right here. Now it looks like the only part that might actually be replaced is this cap down here is this cap right here. 
So that's nice because that makes this very close to original and we really get to see you know what's going on here. So this here could even be original because I do believe that they shielded the capacitor running to some of the controls here. So I'll zoom you up here, show you what I'm pointing to because it's out of the shot. They have a shielded capacitor right here. And uh, that looks like that's what's shown on the schematic. So there as well. So in order to make this thing work, and in order to make this thing dependable again, all of this stuff has to go. So all of these caps have got to be replaced. Anything that's wax here, the resistors can be checked out. And if they're OK, they can be left alone. The main filter capacitor will have to be you know, replaced. So I might just put replacements on the underside of the chassis here, something that's a little bit easier to get to. The resistors are the early roundy type, which means that they are subject to moisture ingression. But we do know that this radio has been in a very, uh, I guess you could say, climate controlled area. So these might be still relatively close to their value. They may not need to be changed. And as I say, the micas themselves are usually good for the long run, unless they're hiding paper in a mica package here. So I'll show you what I'm talking about. These are mica capacitors right here, and you can see a whole bunch of them in the tuning assembly, right? So let's put this down here, right in here, mica capacitors. Now, if you're saying, oh, those could be paper as well, no, they won't use those in a tuning assembly because this thing would drift all over the place. So mica capacitors are always used in a tuning assembly. So if you're ever wondering about that, oh, have they you know, put you know, hiding paper in these things, in uh, you know the RF or oscillator section that doesn't happen. Anything outside of that section though, you're subject to, you know, it could be paper. Now, if they've used the same kind of body, you know, if you can see similarities between the ones in the tuning section and say the ones that are outside the tuning section, if they look pretty much identical, you would know that they've just used the micas in other places as well if it's not denoted on the actual schematic itself. Before I start working on this chassis, the very first thing that I want to do is get rid of all of the dust on here. It really is quite thick. It's almost like a rug in some areas. So I'll take this out to the shop and hit this with some compressed air, being very careful around the stickers. And I'll also do that on the inside of the wooden case, being very careful around the paperwork inside that as well. So after all the dust is gone and this is clean, we'll get started on component replacement. I've taken the radio out to the shop and blown all the dust off of this inside and out very carefully not to disturb anything and I've also taken the bottom portion of the case same thing blown all the dust out of that and taken the case as well and funny enough when I did blow the dust out of the case I found an actual license paper from the owner of this radio back in 1950. So now what I need to do is just get rid of all of these paper and foil capacitors here. And I'm going to also check these capacitors right here to make sure that these ones are not actually paper. So that's very, very easy to do. Open one end and put my very sensitive forecasting tester on there. And if they look like an open connection, basically, I know that these are not paper type capacitors because anything with paper in it now is is leaking they leak DC right so these capacitors are supposed to block DC and pass AC if you want to look at it like that so now what's causing these things to fail is these capacitors are actually turning into resistors because the paper inside has become acidic and they're actually becoming conductive so these are turning into high value resistors and of course that causes them to heat and the wax to drip off I have the bottom of the case here let's grab the bottom of the case and you can see the wax from that one has dripped off there so this is blown out and as you can see I mean there's still a pretty thick layer on that you're probably saying well what are you going to do about the rest the remnants here usually what I do is I clean these off with WD-40 so that works very well and it doesn't promote rust and it cleans the chassis very nicely and for you know, tougher to clean areas sometimes I'll mix uh, the WD-40 with a bit of an abrasive and that really cleans things up very nicely but when we get to that point I'll show you that as well so right now I'm up against getting all of these capacitors out of here I'll get these replaced and I'll come back and show you exactly what I've done and why I've done it 
Oh, and one other thing that I should very quickly mention just before I start replacing these things is to take note of the band end of the capacitors. So this is the outside foil end. And you'll notice that in these circuits, the outside foil end is always placed to the lower impedance portion of the circuit. So you can see that this is chassis ground here, and you can see the band end of this capacitor is to chassis ground, and the band end of this capacitor is to chassis ground. You can also see, if you look at this one here, you see this is chassis ground, you can see the band end right there. Now on capacitors, this is denoted as the outside foil side, and sometimes, depending on the capacitor, it just says ground end on the actual capacitor. So it's very important to take note of that in these radios. They did it for a reason way back when, and we still need to take note of that. So the new capacitors that I install, I will locate the outside foil end and place that end towards the chassis. Here's another one up here. You can see it's soldered to the chassis and you can see the band end right there. So if you're ever working on one of these radio receivers and you haven't been taking note of this, uh, it's a good time to actually start taking note of that and putting these new capacitors in the correct way because yes, it does affect the performance of the radio receiver. All right, so I'll get all of this happening and I'll be back. Just for the fun of it, I've opened one end of this capacitor. You can see how incredibly bad it is. It's actually bubbled. You see that? It's actually bubbled up here. That's how hot it has got. So we pretty much know that this capacitor is going to be toast. So I've just clipped one end of it right now and let's see what happens with this together. And I've got a replacement. So I'll show you the difference. All right, so the positive end of the tester here and the, and the actual sense lead and watch this, okay. And as you can see, it's just, it's not moving. And that isn't even in the forecast position. So this is a desensitized position. Nothing is moving, red and red, which means very, very bad. So what I'll do now is I will take this cap here, the new one. So this is the replacement cap right here, you see that? and I will clip it onto the leads here and watch the tester now. So clip it on, it'll move quick, so off the first one anyways. So keep an eye on the tester and I'll just clip it on here off to the side. If I can get it clipped in, there you go. Look at how quickly that's moving down. And that's what a new capacitor should look like. So now it's on the yellow scale, which is getting close to the home run. And as you can see, it's gone green, very low leakage, no problems. Brand new capacitor, that's what it should look like. And then of course, if we remove this again and put this onto here. So the sense lead always goes to the open lead. As you can see, that's really, really bad. Very, very bad. Now this is so incredibly sensitive that it'll actually sense the resistance of my body through the vinyl boot, so if I hold the vinyl boot and I touch the chassis. So that's what it's looking for. It's looking for a very, very, very minute amount of resistance. So it's looking for the leakage in the capacitor. And as you can see, it's incredible. So it's just, it's not even moving off the two, the two red lights here. So very, very bad. So very handy tool to have if you're working on these radios, if you'd like to build this. I have all the plans, schematics, diagrams, component layout maps, PC board layouts, everything on Patreon. This is something that I've designed and released to the community. So check that out. That's part of my electronics course there. So really good example of why you do not buy one of these radios and plug them in before doing any type of recapping because a lot of the times this type of deal right here will burn out the power supply in this radio and make the actual restoration of a radio receiver like this much more costly. So always be careful about that when you buy these things. Before I go about installing the new capacitors into the circuit here, I wanna locate the outside foil end on these new capacitors so that way I can install them into circuit correctly. You may be asking yourself, well, why wouldn't they mark the new ones if it was so incredibly important? Well, the answer is very simple. How often do you see circuitry like this nowadays? Basically never, unless it's a custom build, right? Maybe some guitar amplifiers, things like that. These newer capacitors are designed to be put on circuit boards. And what can you put right underneath this capacitor? A ground plane layer. 
So if there's a ground plane layer under this capacitor, there really is no need to mark the outside foil in because you actually have shielding right on the circuit board itself. It really is that simple. It's just not cost effective to basically take these capacitors and situate them the correct way as they're coming down the line, add another test to actually put signal across them and locate the outside foil. It's expensive to do that. Yet back in the day they needed to do that because we have lots of flying leads inside this chassis. It's a point to point construction. Now what is the outside foil end of a capacitor and why is it so incredibly important? Well, whenever you look at a capacitor and you see a band end on the capacitor, what that means is the lead that's closest to that end is attached to the outermost foil in that capacitor. So effectively, if this was tied to the chassis and this was to say a grid or in, you know some sort of bypass circuit or something like that in an RF application, this would be attached to the more sensitive end of the circuit. This would go to the lower impedance portion of that circuit. So what that means is, if this was tied to the chassis, say for example, this would be shielded all the way up to this end by this lead. So if it's tied to the chassis, you can picture this like sliding a coaxial braid over the outside of the capacitor and it's completely shielded right up to that lead. So if this is tied into a sensitive portion of an audio or an RF circuit, you have shielding right up to this point. Well, what happens if you flip this around and tie this end of the chassis? and this is to the sensitive portion of the circuit. Well, that would mean that this is all exposed right into that portion of the circuit. And what if you had a filament lead or this was around some other noisy circuitry? What would end up happening then? Well, you would have a noise pickup like I'm going to show you right now. I'm going to be the noise antenna and I'm going to insert noise into this capacitor and you will see that indicated right here. It's pretty bright, but you can see these lights right now. They're kind of just going, is, is, this is flickering back and forth and this is just, you know, deflecting. It doesn't know what end is the outside foil because I'm not inserting noise from my body. So you can see it's the same each direction. So when you see these lights going back and forth, it's electrically flipping this capacitor around is what it's doing so I can locate that outside foil in. So I, with my fingers, am going to act as a noise antenna. So what we're looking for is the least amount of LEDs lit. So the least, not the most, but the least amount with the corresponding LED on the bottom will tell us the outside foil. Why is it the least amount lit? Well, when this is lit up, it's shielding me when this is at the lowest point so I can tell what side is actually shielding me, which is shielding the noise from my body. That's why it's the least amount of LEDs, okay? So I'll grab this like so and you see all the noise and now it's down to nothing. All the noise and down to nothing. So what this is telling me right now is the least amount of LEDs lit with the corresponding LED is the outside foil end. This is the outside foil end right here. All right, so all this entire deflection you see when it's this way, this is noise that I'm inserting into this capacitor just by holding it. Now just think if this was in a sensitive portion of the circuit and this was close to an AC filament lead or something like that or in a sensitive RF circuit. You can already see how incredibly important it is in a rebuild to put these the correct way. They didn't mark the outside foil end on these capacitors for no reason. Okay, so I'll flip this around and you'll see now that the least amount of LEDs will be on this side. If I flip it around, you can see it's on this side right now, right? So I'll flip it around, put this on here. And there you go. It's on this side now. So since that is the least amount, I've already marked this before, I actually go through and I batch mark these things with a felt marker so that way I can just go about installing these. If we look, look, it's already marked on that end. So what I do is I just take a felt marker and put a little dot here as not to deface the capacitor. So it's kind of just inconspicuous, but that tells me that's the outside foil end. So when I replace this melted wax capacitor, the outside foil end here would go towards the chassis like so. 
And I would keep this lead, if this is going to a very sensitive portion of the circuit, as short as possible, keeping in mind that if you're tying to a tube socket, you will need some form of thermal decoupling because if the tube does get hot, say it's a power tube, sometimes the lead out pin will get very hot and you don't want to damage the cap, so sometimes you have to leave them just a little bit longer. But I will tend to make the end shorter that goes to the higher impedance portion of the circuit. Now to give you an example, here's another one that I've cut out of this radio. That was the one that was right over here. So as you can see, this is marked the outside foil end. Okay, so let's just test this out. We should have the least amount of LEDs on this end, right? Because this is shielded all the way up to this end. So I'll just put this in here like so. Look at that. Full and the least amount of LEDs. So the least amount of LEDs is on this side right here. Outside foil end. Right, so you can even see they've marked it. I think they've even spelt it on this one. Yeah, it does say outside. Well, it's kind of messed up. Oh no, they've marked this as ground end. So it's just ground end on this one. So again, sometimes outside foil, sometimes ground end. It's interchangeable. That's how they mark them. Whereas this wax capacitor here will say outside foil. So let me see here. Yeah, you can see, well, you can see a bit of out without scraping this off here. You know, you get the idea. Outside foil. This capacitor is pretty, pretty wrecked. But, yeah, you can kind of get an idea there. What works is, um, there it is. Outside foil. So what works if you need to read these things is uh, you can take a hot air tool. If, you're, if you have a hot air tool for working with solid state equipment, you can heat the wax up and wipe it off real quick. And uh, it makes these things a lot easier to read, especially when all the dirt and everything is, is caught in the wax. So this is 0.1 microfarad, as you can see here. And then, of course, the replacement is the same, which is 104. Right? You see 104 right there. So anyways... Very important. This is a project, another one of my inventions. This is all the designs, plans, schematic, uh, printed circuit board, layout, build instructions, everything is all released on Patreon. So if you do work on this type of equipment, guitar amplifiers, or anything where you have you know, flying leads like this, and even in some solid state equipment, it is important as well if there isn't a ground plane layer underneath the capacitor it is important to put it the correct way, but most modern designs, if they're using something like this, and it is important, there will be a ground pane layer and a circuit board. But anyways, you may find this useful. Uh, if you're working on this stuff a lot, this tool is absolutely indispensable. This uh, is something that I use all the time. I can't tell you how many miles is on this thing now. These look like mica capacitors, but I want to be sure that they are not paper caps, because if they are, they have to go with these ones as well. Because remember, all the paper is becoming acidic by now. So, do you think these are paper, or do you think that they're mica? Let's find out. Place your bets now. This looks like it's relatively easy to remove. It looks like it's just looped around this. Is it? It is. So there it is. 100 picofarad is what that's rated at. So, we can tell whether this is paper or mica with a flick of a switch. This is in the forecast position. I'll just attach positive lead here and the sense lead to the open lead all right so you can see this a bit better I will knock the brightness down just a touch and if this doesn't go immediately green it is a paper cap wouldn't you know it that is a paper capacitor so there's a bunch of them in here then so what does that tell us? Well, it tells us we got more work to do. Let's get this out of here, shut that off. So that means that, I don't know if you can see it here. Can you see that one? This one here? That has to go, that has to go, that has to go. And this one up here looks like it's the same type of cap. This one looks like it's 470 picofarad, but the same markings on it. So there are other capacitors that look like these over here, but I know for a fact that those will be mica. Why do you ask? Well, if you put a paper capacitor in an oscillator section, you'd have to have a steering wheel on the dial control here, and you'd be moving that thing around to keep it on frequency because it would drift all over the place. So 
No problems in the oscillator section. We don't have to test those because we know that those will definitely be mica. And micas are usually not leaky. Usually not leaky whatsoever. So when we try the radio out, that'll be the test for those. And uh, by changing these things out, you got to be very careful. You don't want to change any micas in the oscillator section unless absolutely necessary. Because if you do, you will affect the dial tracking. So when I say dial tracking, I mean the dial will not align up to the points that are written on the actual glass. So even through an alignment, if you change these out, so you got to be very, very careful. And if it doesn't align up in the first place anyways, then you can tell that there's a good chance that maybe one of these things is faulty. As I'm going through, and I'm replacing all the capacitors, so this capacitor was soldered to this lug on the tube socket here, there's also a resistor soldered to that lug as well. So before I replace the capacitor, I also want to test that resistor, because if I put a new capacitor in here and find the resistor's bad, I'm just going to have to do this all over again, right? So this here uses the body end dot or body end line principle to read these resistors here. So I don't know if you can see that very well. So in this case, the body is brown, so that's one. The end is red, so that's two. The line or the dot is orange, so that's three. So we have one, two, and three zeros, which means 12K ohms, and silver is at 10%. So this should be close to 12K somewhere. So I'll put a meter across that. That resistor leads over here. And I will put this right here on the socket. Now since vacuum tube circuits a lot of the time are in somewhat of a high resistance type circuit, you can just read the resistance right in circuit. And that's what the resistance of that resistor is. So we'll say, you know, comfortably 14.6K ohms. And that's supposed to be 12K ohms. So not a good thing. So since that is in a screen grid portion of the circuit, if we lower the voltage on the screen grids of the tubes, or A tube, we're going to also lower the gain of the receiver. We definitely don't want that. So we want that as close to 12K ohms as possible. So as I'm going through and replacing the capacitors, I'm also testing the resistors, and this one will definitely have to go because we want a sensitive receiver. Here's a rundown of what's been done to the radio and my thought process as I've been going through this, replacing all of these components. This thing at this point is pretty much ready to attach a speaker and try out. So all of the out of spec components have been replaced and there was a lot of them. So they're all over the place. You can see all of the brand new components in here. If you look carefully, you'll spot a new component just about everywhere. Some of them are even hiding. You can see a little cap down in here and uh, you know, they're underneath here. You can see this little cap down in here. Lots of little hard to get areas where you know parts and pieces have been replaced. Since I'm using modern capacitors, I can situate the capacitors in more optimum or ideal areas. I don't need to run all the wires to a central portion of the chassis and you know just have one cap there. So it allows me to optimize the design just a little bit more. So you can see here I've got a cap that is soldered to a standoff here. From the way the camera is viewing this, it's a little bit hard to see, but I'll move the chassis here in a moment. The original capacitor is completely disconnected. So I cleaned off the legs on all three of the capacitors, and all three of those legs are now bent together like a little tripod. And that little tripod is holding a little ceramic standoff right here. So that little ceramic standoff, I've lifted the wires from this one portion of the cap because there are so many wires running to that one, you know, they used it as a tie point. And I've tied them to the top of the ceramic standoff, which allows me not to you know, have to join all the wires and then try to re-optimize everything here. The fact that this cap solders close to this braid that runs off to the main tuning cap here, and there's another one over here. I wanted to keep this one in exactly the same area because the designers may have actually played around with this for a while to stop issues, maybe the thing from oscillating or you know doing something else that's you know, rather interesting. So other components were very easily moved around and some of them were just moved completely around. This one here, originally tied from the tube socket up to this point, there's a lead off wire that comes over here. I can put this new ceramic disc 
right across the le the actual lugs on the tube socket. This is just a snubber for the audio transformer. I've also upped its value, the uh, voltage anyways. So this is now 1.4 kV rated cap. And of course the value is as close to the factory value as I can get right there. Uh, lots of resistors replaced. Uh, as you can see, the other electrolytics, there's one under here and there's one down here. Again, situated to a more optimum area. So basically the lead that ran from this area over to the cap was tied to this point here. So again, I can actually take the cap and put it right next to that point. I can get it closer so I don't have to have that extra run of lead there. Same with this one. This filter cap was tied in right down in here, but they ran a lead all the way over to this cap. So with the new caps and them being smaller and of course better temperature ratings as well, I can just mount this right here. So that worked out very, very well. I'll show you this ceramic standoff here that's on that little tripod. Put this down here. And you can see how that's acting as a little tripod and that's just holding that ceramic standoff up. Nice thing about those little ceramic standoffs is you can solder the base of them. So that's what's happened with this one. I've just soldered it right to those three little legs. I pinched them together real tight. And then when I put the ceramic standoff in, it presses them apart. So there's lots of tension there and it's just soldered all the way around. That worked out very well. Again, I want to make this build as dependable as possible. You know, we, the design might be increased or, you know, I guess you could say improved just a little bit. So it may perform just a little bit better than it did in 1939, but I want to keep it just about as close as possible. So with that being said, I also want to protect this set. They never put fuses in these sets when they came out. So something really bad went wrong, say there was a filament lead short or something went wrong with a transformer or say the, the, uh, the high voltage rectifier was to end up shorting or something like that. What it can very easily do is cook this transformer or cause other issues. So it's always a good idea to install a line fuse. So I've used a somewhat of a period correct type of cord. This is wrapped around the rectifier on the bottom here. A period, you know, correct, it's a cloth looking cord. So reproduction cord, kind of a nice touch. And I've also installed a vinyl grommet here. They never used grommets. They just ran it through the back side of the chassis. They had what was a brass ring in here to, to basically keep the edges dull. So they put this kind of a crimp ring in here. So what I do on top of that is I install a vinyl grommet, as you can see there. So that's a little bit more protection for the cord. And then on top of that, let me get this into focus here. So what I do is I run this through. The hot lead runs over here to the fuse holder. You can see there's strain relief here, so this can move around without causing any issues. So this runs over to a fuse holder, and then the fuse holder runs up to the switch. So the hot is in line with the switch, very first thing. So just to be as careful as possible, the neutral runs over here to a tie point that I've added because from the factory, what they end up doing with the line cord is they take the original line cord and they just use tape. Uh, do I have it here still? I think I do. I'll just walk over here on the other side of the bench and grab that for you. I cut the old line cord right at the tape. So this is factory when you see this. You might think, oh, somebody's put this in. No, they, they actually do that from the factory. They wrap these in this somewhat, it almost looks like hockey tape, but it isn't, but it's a, you know an insulating tape. And uh, they put that on the cord there. So this is a much cleaner install here, quite a ways away from the bottom portion of the pan, which is nice. And um, there's, I use high heat fiberglass tubing on this. And so that the actual line cord wire, which you can see a little bit of here runs down. So this just protects the wire right here. If there's any type of movement or anything, it just protects everything and keeps everything nice and safe as this runs down along the chassis, right? Because this is going to be down here. And I uh, just say somebody was to you know, try to twist the line cord around in circles, right? This keeps this nice and safe from any type of heat or anything like that. So the restraint that I use is two zap straps or tie straps is what you want to call them up here in Canada we call them zap straps so and I put them both together and then you pull them like this and then they kind of both come together and then they squeeze and then what I use is a plier to pull each side tight evenly around the cord so it squeezes the cord and after that's done I put super glue on this as well so this is not moving that's a permanent piece on there right now on the inside of this vinyl grommet that acts as a stop for the grommet and this cloth cord is extremely tight. This isn't a rubber grommet, it's a vinyl grommet, so they last a long time and it's tight. So this is really actually very hard to turn in here. So much more firm than the actual factory 
uh, you know, installation here, the factory when you just turn around, they had a knot on each side and everything like that. So this is firm. If I wanted to even make this more rigid, I could even put a touch of super glue around the vinyl grommet itself to the metal chassis and it would be pretty rock hard. But this is, this is absolutely fine. This is good enough. A little bit of movement is not going to hurt anything. So that is all installed in there. Now, when I'm starting out with this thing, I haven't put a fuse in this or even tried this yet, but uh, when I put a fuse in here to try this out, I'm gonna just install for the beginning a one amp fuse and uh, that'll be nice and safe. If anything is wrong with this transformer or anything like that, that will just go like that. There'll be no problems with it. So uh, a lot of the times I find a one amp fuse in this application is absolutely fine for the purposes. You know, I, I measure the current draw of the radio receiver and, uh, you know, see what the maximum is and then, you know, determine whether it should be a slow blow or a fast blow and all that kind of stuff. So there's a quite a process in there. I'll actually dedicate a video to choosing fuses for these things here down the road. Uh, many people want to put what is known as an absolute value type of fuse in there. So basically something very major has to go wrong with this thing uh, in order to pop that fuse. So it's basically just to protect, um, you know, in a case of a real catastrophic failure to say, uh, say that the primary winding in the transformer dead shorted or something like that, uh, that absolute value fuse would just you know, go away. So an absolute value fuse is much higher than something that's actually measured or rated. So uh, this here will actually be measured and rated. So if something does pull just a little bit too much current, uh, you know, something goes, I would say, quite a ways out of spec, uh, what would end up happening is that fuse would go and protect the circuitry here. It's a good idea nowadays. Uh, you know, they these things were put together so fast. I'll show you something on the upper chassis here, stuff that still has to be done. Since these are going down the line so incredibly fast, they're buzzing these things in so quickly. And because they've come in quickly and they've gone in crooked, a portion of the washer is pressing down on that actual rubber bushing harder than the rest and it's caused it to split. Now this rubber still feels like it did way back when it was factory. It's as soft as a car tire. It's just split. And it's just split around the outer edges and we can still save this. Uh, remanufacturing these soft rubber bushings would be a real pain. So luckily, I didn't have to do that in this radio. I can save these with just a larger washer. So I'll put a larger washer on the top side here and that'll press down evenly on this rubber bushing and that'll be able to save that. You can see this one here is very, very crooked. It's come in very tight here and it's caused a bunch of splitting here as well. So that is a nice easy fix in this application. Thankfully, uh, I have one of the uh, washers here. So here's an example of one of the washers that would be on top here. Now I need to be very careful that when I do put these new washers on that it doesn't come into contact with the capacitor assembly. This entire capacitor assembly is insulated from the chassis by these rubber washers. You can see nothing is touching anywhere. The dial string is a is you know like a nylon string. Nothing is touching the chassis. In some cases, they used a cloth type string as well. So at any rate, this feels like it's this actually may be a, a cloth type of string here. But so the reason that they've done this is in order to make this thing perform correctly in the RF world. There's a big difference between RF grounds and DC grounds. You'll remember on the bottom side of the chassis you saw two braids that came off this capacitor and attached to the chassis in two areas only and that's because it's an RF ground. You cannot treat RF grounds like you would treat uh, say a normal DC ground and that's the reason that these are stood off and isolated by these kind of like a rubber puck. This is a really thick rubber puck on the bottom and it looks like they've actually added one extra spacer so they've done some modifications from the factory at some point to space this up just a little bit more probably to, you know, maybe make the buttons line up in the front of the case or something like that. So lots and lots of thought has gone into this. If you're interested in understanding more about RF grounds and DC grounds and the difference between them, even though they still attach to the same chassis, I talk all about that in my electronics course. I clarify a lot of this stuff and get right into the theory and all of that stuff. So you may want to check that out. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to remove all of these screws, as you can see here. Let's remove this one here. Some of this cracks will even go back together again. You can see that the cracks are rejoining because the pressure is removed. You can see how tight it was down on this one area. 
I'll just uh, zoom in so you can kind of get an idea of how soft this is still. This is cracked, but you can get an idea. It feels about the, you know, it feels like car uh, a nice soft car tire is about the, how soft that rubber is. Nice and soft. So no problems with that whatsoever. And that's nice because it's a real pain when you have to replace those, right? Still lots of space between this and the metal chassis. So what I'll do is I will take this and put this in here like so. Wind that screw back through that center again. So that's really tight in there. All right. And then what I'll do is, let's make sure that's down in there like so. Put this back in here. And then what I'll do is just wind this down, making sure to cover all of the top portion of the washer so it's nice and even. And put a bit of tension on it. And as you can see, there's lots of space between this and the actual, the frame. Move the focus over to that maybe a bit. Let's see here, where are we? Right over here. And as you can see, it uses that whole washer now and it'll stop it from splitting even more because now the pressure will be even because of this larger washer and it, I won't get that splitting action like you can see we're getting over here. This one here is the same. It's really driven down tight in this area. So luckily, that will fix things up. Just a bit of a tighten there, and uh, that's good to go for a very long period of time again. So I'll get that done with the top portion here, and at that point, before I go any further with this thing, let's put some power to it and see if it comes to life. I'm about to power this radio up for the very first time, and doing that, of course, there always is risk involved. So we don't know what's going to happen with this thing because who knows how many years this thing has been sitting. We don't even really know if the power transformer is shot at this point. And that's another good reason to have a fuse installed. So if you're following along as I'm doing this rebuild and say you're working on something or likewise, you know, like this piece of equipment here or anything else, you're doing so at your own risk. If you're uncomfortable with working on this or you don't know what you're doing and you're working on this stuff, don't work on it. What happens in these older vacuum tube pieces of equipment is they take the what's coming out of the line and it goes into a transformer and it steps the voltage up. So you're dealing with elevated voltages in any vacuum tube piece of equipment. So you have to be very, very careful. So again, be very careful if you're following along and again, you're doing so at your own risk. All right, so I will grab a fuse. I have my favorite one amp fuse off to the side here. So I'll just pop this into the fuse holder right here. I'll go about grabbing the speaker here. This speaker is put, was put in a very, very safe area. Uh, one thing to notice about these speakers, the travel in this is also very nice and it's nice and clean too. There's no grit or anything in the uh, voice coil. So these are electromagnetic speakers and when you first run them, it's a very good idea to have these face down like so. So what ends up happening is when the radio plays, if there's any dirt and grit in there, it'll end up vibrating and falling out. And a lot of the times just running these things face down for any extended period of time will clear up any buzzing or any issues that you have. So this is a little trick for you. Because, you know, these things are sitting like this in a radio cabinet, right? And stuff settles in there and works its way in. So always a good thing. Oh, never clean these with compressed air. Uh, I'll always use a very, very soft brush and just clean the dust off of them, especially when you have a, you know, very nice speaker like this one right here. Okay, so I'll plug this in right here, like so. So we've got the fuse in, this in. Make sure this is off. Turn that off. Be careful with that cord around the paper there. Move this around. Plug this into my isolation transformer and current limited variac supply. This cord's all twisted up. So let's plug this in over here. And I'll just, since this all got brand new components, let's just go right to the max. So I'll turn this on. Okay, we're ready to go. So I'll turn this on. Let's see, what do we got here? I think it's the volume, turn that down. I don't know where this is, so I'll grab one of the knobs. This is the, uh, this here moves everything around. Oh, this here, by the way, this capacitor I didn't mention, I believe I said this was 470. That other dot 
was uncolored. They didn't put black in there. They left it just a body colored brown. So it looked 470 on the schematic. And it also measured the previous one as 47. So this, the replacement is correct. It's a 47 in here. These little things that you have to pay attention. They didn't color the dot. They left it the body color. So mistake on their end for sure. Good thing I checked that because I would make the front end of this thing deaf. Oh, I'm hearing. Hear that? That's that's a good sign. Good sign that this needs some contact cleaner. I'm gonna have to hose this thing down with contact cleaner anyways, right? But I think this is the tone though, if I remember correctly. This is Listen to that, life. So I'll turn that right down because I don't want to be clicking anything over here. And and uh, so it was, uh, I think at one end, I think that is, it's either going to be phone or broadcast. Let's so, yeah. Okay, so what I'll do is I will grab an antenna from over here. It's nicely coiled up. Hopefully that's going to reach. I think it will. I should have put a longer cable on this. This is from the last radio setup here. Okay, so the ground for this is just ground. So I just clip onto this. You can even connecting the ground. You can tell this thing wants to receive like crazy. So I'm going to turn this down. And I'll attach this to the antenna binding post. These two are just shorted on the other side. Oh, wow. Bank of Canada keeping interest rates. Yeah, it's definitely the uh, the tone control. Wow. Well, no problems there. It's just working like crazy already. And think, no IF alignment, no any other type of alignment, and it's just coming to life like that. And that's just simply from fresh components on the underside. Now, keep in mind, depending what kind of an atmosphere radios like this have been you know, in the past, a lot of people, what they do is they find anything that they can twist a screwdriver in. So like the IF transformers or anything, when this, the performance is degrading, they think that it just needs to be tuned. Well, the, the reason that it is degrading in the first place is because the components on the underside of the chassis are bad or say one of the tubes has gone bad. As I've said in many, many of my other videos, rarely is a vacuum tube the problem. Vacuum tubes are actually very, very dependable, you know, contrary to, you know, popular belief, but they are very, very dependable. It's the components around the vacuum tubes that always go away. And of course, the biggest one being the wax capacitors. So a lot of these things have been screwdrivered throughout time really bad. So they have to be brought back into tune again. So we're going to retune this and bring it to optimum performance like it was when it came from the factory. And then we'll try it out. So I'll show you some of that process as well. So this has got a, quite a few bands in it. I'll, I'll tune one band and I'll show you how that one band is done and the rest are pretty much the same. It's just rinse and repeat and we'll do all that here in just a moment. So let's see if the other bands are working. So this here is the broadcast band we know. So we have a short wave band. The fact that we still hear static means the oscillator's running. If it went dead quiet, we'd have no oscillator. No problems. Next one. No problems again. No problems with that band as well. No problems with that. The oscillator's running there as well. So all in all, it's working really well so far. 
And then I think the last position is phono. It should get quiet here. And there it'll get quiet. Now if I touch the connection to the phono, we should hear a hum in the speaker. So the phono section is working as well. So all in all, this thing looks like it is, right now, it's running pretty perfect. But what we're going to do is perform an alignment anyways and just make sure that it absolutely is running perfect. And then I will have to do a dial alignment, so make sure that the dial tracking is correct with what is on the glass. Chances are, because of component movement under here, the oscillator has shifted just a little bit. And if it's shifted just a little bit, of course, the, the needle on the face won't align up correctly with what's written on the glass. So that'll all be done here quite shortly. So all in all, so far, looking really, really good. One thing that we didn't test is the eye tube. And the eye tube is one of the most important parts of the radio when looking at it. This is what really gives the radio its personality. And having a bright green eye tube is an absolute must. So let's see what happens here. I'll turn this on. Let's see, uh, I can turn this on over here. Lots of switches to flick on. There we go. Turn on the isolation transformer and very accidentally I felt like this was still on. So I just turned the chassis around and let's see together if this is going to be bright. I'll turn these two lamps down and I'll zoom on into this if I can. And it's looking to me like that's pretty done. So let's go, I think we're still on phono from the last portion of the test. There it is. That is very, very weak. I don't know if you can see that. You can just see that faint green glow in there. Very common. So again, the target area and these things, they all burn out. So let's turn that off. And in order to get this out, it's actually very simple. So I'll turn that off. I'll actually shut off the isolation transformer and Variac supply because I don't want to be grabbing the chassis here and moving things around while, while I'm doing this. So put this down here. To get the eye tube out is actually very easy. So this is probably going to be seized up or frozen since, oh, there it is, way back when. So you just loosen that up and then slide this out. There's a little cup on here. It's probably very fragile, so I'll be careful with that. That just stops the light of the dial from shining in here so that it doesn't interfere with the eye. It gives you a nice, nice look. So what happens is these just unplug like so. There is a one meg resistor in these sockets always, which could get checked as well. So we'll just te test the function of the eye tube. We'll test the resistor with a new eye tube. So there's the old eye tube. So let's see here. Grab another one here. Pull this out. There's a brand new eye tube with a nice bright area. So what I'll do is I'll get this plugged into the socket and get everything situated again. This is a lot to do on camera here. Basically the reverse of what you just saw. And if the eye tube isn't in the right area, you can rotate the socket so that you can get the, the opening in the area that you want it to be. So you can rotate this in this little clip right here. So I'll get this all done. We'll turn the radio back on and see what it looks like with a brand new eye. All right, new eye tube is installed and everything is propped up again. I haven't cleaned the chassis or anything, so I'm gonna disassemble all this again anyways and clean everything up. So this is just temporary, but let's see how well it works. All right, so I'll go back over here to the isolation transformer and turn that back on. I moved the dial out of the way, get this out of the way here so that it looks a little bit better. And uh, let's turn it on and see how bright the thing is. Now this is from a ways back too, so. Now that's how it should look. It's so bright it's washing the camera out. So I'll zoom in on that. Look at how bright that is. So what I'll do is I'll knock down the brightness here just a touch. All right. That is very, very bright. So there's no replacement for a brand new eye tube that really makes these old radios look special. So uh, let's see how it deflects. Let's uh, tune in a station here.
Virginia. Right now, we're not expecting to be you know, hard hitting as. as so it works very well. No problems with that at all. Turn that down. So, again, this is uh, how it normally looks. Very, very bright. So that should look outstanding in the radio. Now, I'm often tempted to knock the brightness down of these eye tubes just a little bit so that way the target area lasts longer. Usually these are just, it was a real selling point of these radios, right? The tuning eye. So they made them very bright. And I can tell you right now with, you know, no exceptions, that's extremely bright. Like, you know, compare the brightness of that to this bulb. You can see how bright that eye is, just incredibly. That's green, right? As you saw when I put a filter on on the camera. So I might install a, a small value resistor in line with the eye tube here just to knock the brightness down. Now I will have you know this, this uses a factory 6U5 tube in it. And the 6E5 variant is much more common. And not only that, it's a much more sensitive tube. And because it is more sensitive, it allows you to add that resistor and knock the brightness down just a little bit so you get some more life out of the tube. And that's why the replacement tube I've put in here is a 6E5, not a 6U5. This is the stock schematic for this radio receiver. And as you can see, the eye circuit really is quite simple. So they've tied the target directly into the B plus line here. And we have our one meg resistor, which is underneath the chassis. Again, on this one, that's kind of nice. They didn't put it in the socket portion. So if you need to replace this, you can get to that without having to pop that whole thing apart. And then we have our signal lead coming in from the AVC line here. And that's what causes our eye deflection. All right. So again, the 6U5 and the 6G5 tuning eye is the less sensitive version. And the 6E5 is, is much more sensitive than that. So keeping this in mind here, so this is the modified schematic right here. And as you can see, this is now a 6E5. You can see between the B plus line and the target, I now have a 22K resistor and a 10 microfarad 450 volt cap here. So this is what gives us our dimming effect. It dims the eye out just a little bit, not a whole lot, but enough to really save the target. The 10 microfarad cap after the 22K resistor here is just to create stability. You'll notice that when you tune the dial on these radios here, the eye will get bright when it's on frequency and when it's off frequency, it'll get dim again, right? So what happens is when you're on frequency, this develops negative bias. And of course you, you get a uh, AVC action, automatic voltage control action. So what ends up happening is on a strong signal, the tubes are kind of being biased off. So that's shutting the tubes down. So you actually have less current draw when this is receiving than when it's not receiving. So you, as you're going on and off of stations, you get the bright and dim effect of the eye tube. So this just stabilizes that a whole lot. So it makes it a really smooth transition so it doesn't look so quick. So like the eyes getting bright, dim, bright, dim on and off of frequencies. So that's all that's there for, basically just comfort, all right? So you can see the mod there, and then you can see here on the AVC line, because this is a much more sensitive tube, we have a 22 meg resistor, so that's 22 meg ohms resistor here, and then we have another 22 meg resistor to ground. So we're just creating a voltage divider with this. The reason the values are so high on this is because we don't want to load the AVC line. So technically we have a 44 meg load to ground, which is almost invisible to the AVC line. Again, the current available at this point is very low, so we don't want to drag the AVC down and change the performance of the radio receiver, and that's why I'm using 44 megs worth of resistance. 0.001 mic cap is just a filter on the grid line to make the transition nice and smooth and to keep any noise off the eye. So if you eliminate this one capacitor here, you'll notice that it'll give you kind of a, a, sh a shadow in a shadow because it gets a bit of noise in there. So putting this across here, the uh, cap across here is just a filter and it cleans it up very nicely. So we get nice smooth action. So we have a corrective action here for the AVC line, basically for the, you know, when this is pulling current on stations or off of stations, I should say, and pulling less current on stations, we have the smoothing action so we don't get that bright dim effect. 
and we have another capacitor here that basically smooths the action of the opening and the closing of the eye. Now the 6E5 that I'm using is the Jan variation of that and that is this right here. I've got another one in a box brand new here. So Jan stands for Joint Army and Navy. So way back in the day Jan tubes are the best quality tubes and this tube here <clears throat> is the tube that's in the radio that's just right over here so that's this tube here so we have a very high quality tube that's very rugged so we're going to get extra eye life from that and then of course with the eye saver circuit on top of it we'll have an incredibly long life to this eye so this eye should be functional for many many years of use Let's perform an IF alignment on this radio receiver using some older test equipment. That's always a lot of fun. So many of you might recognize the OS-8 from the Navy Department Bureau of Ships. This is a very neat old oscilloscope. They have a neat history behind them as well. Much of this stuff you can actually find on my channel. I've done the restorations on them. So just look in my list of videos. You find the E200C. So this is a precision apparatus company signal generator restored this. I designed this frequency counter and shared that on this channel. So this is an old clock case and I designed a Nixie tube counter and put it in there and it actually does math as well. Inside there's presets. You can remove the IF in these older receivers. So say I need to remove 455 kilocycles or 460 kilocycles in this case. I can remove that right in the counter and I can give old vacuum tube receivers a Nixie tube digital display. So that's all on this channel as well. Lots of neat stuff on this channel. I've had many questions about this in my Patreon electronics course to actually post this counter and I may just get that together and post it soon. So uh, lots of work to grab those files. Uh, I'm telling you lots and lots of work went into this thing here. So you can, again, you can just check my list of videos here and you'll find all this stuff. So you can see the IF is it set to 460 kilocycles. So that's this thing here. That's a signal generator. You can see that move around. In fact, I'll zoom you into that for a second and you can Check out the Nixies. So I'll zoom you in. So you need to set this. I'll just move the dial down here. I have it uh, blanking the first digits. So the first digits, if I you know go to a different range and you can see the digit come in and go to a different range, you can see it just gets rid of the digits that are not being used. So it just basically saves Nixies. But um, They'll last a long time anyways because they're, again, you could say that these are being run very easy. So anyways, this needs to be set at 460. So there it is, 460 kilocycles. And what I'm going to do is use the oscilloscope down here to do the alignment. Try and get everything into the frame here so that you can see it. So I'll set that there. So what I'm going to do is, hopefully you can see this, I'm going to feed the signal in right here. I'm going to use the 6SA7 as somewhat of a buffer. So I'll tie the signal from this end through this cap right here. It's just clipped onto the tube socket here, right to this point right here. So it runs into the grid of the tube here. All right, so it's past this cap. So it's not on the DC side here. It's on the grid side around the, I should say, B plus side here, the plate side of the 6SK7. It's on this side of the blocking cap right here. So we're going to adjust both the upper and lower adjustments on each IF transformer here. So there's a bunch of them here. So they're, they're kind of hiding in here. And I have this uh, pointed away kind of on an angle here. But uh, there's one adjustment here. And if I get under the camera here, hopefully my head isn't in the shot. There's another adjustment up here. And then there's two adjustments on the top as well. I'll move this. This will hum for a moment. Move that out of the way. And there's uh, two adjustments on the top, this adjustment here and this adjustment here. Now I haven't adjusted anything or even played with this since the receiver has been done. So we'll see how far out it actually is because usually through time, you know, people screwdriver this. So what I'm doing is I'm picking the signal off for the oscilloscope at the grid of the 6F6. So it's tied in right here. And that's this cap right here tied into the OS8 right over here. Okay, so I'll turn up the volume here and we should hear this in there. So I'll turn up the signal generator now. All right, so this is on the low output. So there's very little output. We just want enough to see signal here. Okay. In fact, I can actually turn the volume down just a bit. 
So now this is a 460 kilocycle signal getting put into this, going through the IF chain, and then the audio is being picked up after it's detected. And this is what we get on the oscilloscope here. Very easy way to alignment, uh, to do an alignment on this. So the first thing I'm going to do is adjust this transformer right here. So I'll move in to here. Hopefully I can get this in here with seeing this. I'll probably have to move this around just a little bit because the camera is kind of blocking everything here. So I'll get this on to this core here. Okay, there we are. So now when I turn this, we, we're looking for an increase. We don't want to decrease this. We want to increase it. So I'll turn it one way. And that is, you can see it's increasing. If I turn it the opposite way, it'll decrease. So look at, we're, this is, it isn't aligned. Let's put it this way. Look at all that gain we're getting right there, right? So I'll go to the upper slug now and adjust that one on the top side. Same kind of deal. We're just looking for a peak. So that's peaked up now at 460. So now I'll go down to this IF transformer down here and I'll do the lower and the upper. Wow, look at this. Look at all the gain in that, right? So turn this down, just turn the volume down. And I'm just looking for a peak. There's a peak there. And let's go here. Whoa, look at how far out that is. Okay, so I'll turn the volume down. So turn the signal generator down now. And I'll turn the volume up. You want to just as, I guess you could say, just enough signal that it'll show. In fact, I actually want to hear a bit of static in the background. That tells me that the signal is low. Some of the old tricks of using an old signal generator where you don't have an output level meter. You want to hear a bit of hiss in the background so you know that you're not overdriving this and really pushing it into, into the AVC or AGC action. So now I want to go back and do this again. So now I'll go to the bottom slug of that transformer and I'll do that one again. That was so far out. And that's pretty close now. So I'll go up to this one here. I'll go up to the upper IF transformer here, the first IF. And I'll do this one again. Looks pretty much spot on there. It'll go back to the top side. Now, you don't need to get too crazy with the order. If you have IF coming through, you can start at any transformer, just go back and forth, upper, lower, upper, lower, lower, upper, lower, upper. All you need to do is just look for maximum signal. And that's it right there. So that transformer was way off. The upper slug of this IF transformer right here which is the second IF, was way out. So we should get quite a bit of gain now. So this is going to receive even better than you heard before. So quite a bit better. And that's all that's to the IF alignment. Before I do the oscillator alignment in the radio receiver, I want to make the wood look just a little bit better. And I'm going to show you a product that I use that works very, very well. I'm not endorsed by them at all, but it really is a fantastic product here. So I will show you that in just a moment. The reason I want to touch the wood up first is because in order to do the dial alignment, so the oscillator alignment in the radio is making the dial tracking correct. So what we want to do is make the radio receive at 600 AM when the needle is pointing to 600 AM. And then of course, when we move the dial up to the upper end of the dial, the upper alignment point, we want to make sure that the radio is receiving on that frequency so that you know, the scale is reading correctly here because they're two completely separate units, right? So the dial glass is part of the case. As you can see here, it's screwed into the case. So you need to have the chassis in to do that. Now you can get tricky. You can take this out and put this on a flatbed scanner and print off a piece of paper that's to scale and put it underneath the actual needle and, and drag the needle across the paper. That's one way of doing it. But they've left enough room to easily get a hand in there and you know twist the appropriate adjustments inside. So I don't really need to go about doing that. 
So I'll show you that here in just a moment. But again, first, before I go about putting the chassis back in, I have to move this all around and, you know, move everything around. It gets pretty heavy with that in there, right? So what I want to do is make this look a whole lot nicer. So this is a product that I use. It's called Howard Feed and Wax. Works very, very, extremely well. Well, you'll see here in a moment, all right? So I'll open this up here. Put this on my rag here, just a little bit on there. So, like so, all right. Just like that. Watch. And just like that, it looks like a brand new radio. This stuff really is quite incredible. It's great on older finishes. And it just makes these old radios just come right back to life. Something as simple as this. A couple of final touches just before I end up doing the alignment here. So the first one, you'll remember these little felt washers that go behind the knobs. Well, they are kind of small for the knob, right? Right, so they just, you know, not really the correct size. So what I did is I got some felt and punched some new washers. So what I'm going to do is put those on first. As you can see, that covers the hole nicely to stop any debris from getting in there. So there's one here, one here. That one like so, and then the last one. So it all turned out very well. So that's about as close to factory as I imagine I'm going to get. And I'll slip the knobs back on and look at that. Protects it so that the knob doesn't push too far in and drag on the case. And then we have the tuning here. And this one here, so the volume and the tone are interchangeable, so I'll put the dot on the tone. That makes sense because that's the on and off switch. And this is the volume. There we go. Look at that. Ever so nice. So all new felt spacers. The next thing I'm going to do is replace the station identification labels in these push buttons here. These two look pretty bad, and it would be nice to have a nice fresh set in here. Now, I'm not concerned if the lettering that you see in here is accurate to radio stations, just as long as it has a nice set. So you might see a, an interesting little print in here later on. So what I'll do is I'll take these out, come off just as easy as that, and getting the paper out is just as easy again. Here, let me see if I have something that will grab that piece of paper. I do, so here we go. So getting them out is relatively easy. There, it's in focus there, just like that. All you gotta do is just press on it and it pops out like that. And then you can print up some new station identification little labels here and put them in there. If you want something that's accurate to the radio stations around you, that's completely fine. I'm just gonna put ones in here that look like they may have been around in the era of this radio. So I'll get some yellow paper and uh, get started done anyways. Oh, another thing you may want to know about these radios is how to set the presets. There's a little screw inside here and what you do is you tune the radio to the station that you want. So say the radio station is right there and then what you do is you insert a screwdriver in here. I'm gonna do this right alongside the camera. I don't know, can you see that screw in there? So you do is you push that down, loosen the screw and then what you do is you push this right in. Just push it in and then tighten the screw up again. All right, so remember right around 1515 here, okay? So now, just as easy as that, that's how quickly you can set it. So we'll move this out, okay? And now watch, 1515, there you go. That's how easy it is to set these things up. All the new radio station labels are installed and that turned out quite well. So I figured, 
That'd be neat to have in here and a little further south. The first portion of the AM broadcast oscillator alignment is done at 600 kilocycles, or 600 kilohertz if you prefer, AM. So if we take a look at the counter in the background, the signal generator is already set to 600 AM, and the output of the signal generator is running to the antenna jack on the back side of this radio receiver. So much like the IF alignment, this is set at 600 kilocycles now, and we have this modulated by a 400 cycle tone. I don't know, somewhere around 30% or something like that. Just enough to hear it on the dial here. So the whole idea of this is to verify that the oscillator inside this radio is agreeing with where the needle is sitting behind the dial glass. So obviously it should be sitting right behind behind 600, right? So if it's above or below, we have tracking issues and I'll need to adjust the oscillator so that it tracks with the dial correctly. So for example, let's take a look here. I'll move this up. And as you can see, it's just a little bit below 600. It's actually surprisingly close. So it's about one bar below 600. Uh, a lot of radio receivers I've worked on, some of them end up below 550 or above 700, so there's a lot of adjustment to be done, but this is actually very close. So now what I'll do is I'll move this right behind the 600 here, so I'll move it right there. I'm looking at the straight on, so that's right behind the little red arrow below the, the 600, looking at the straight on. You might see it looks a little bit off to you because the camera's on a bit of an angle, but uh, it's right, right behind that little arrow to my eye. So now we should be hearing that tone there. So we don't. So I need to adjust the oscillator coil with this tool right here and bring the oscillator to that point. Okay, so I'll put this in the back side of the radio receiver here and give that coil a twist. And there it is. So I'm listening for the deepest and the loudest tone. I could use the eye in some cases, but I'm feeding such a light signal in from the signal generator that I hardly get any eye deflection at all. I don't want to overload the front end of the receiver while I'm doing this alignment. So I'll sweep past it and I'll go back the other way and I'll determine where the deepest and the loudest tone is. So right there. So what I do is I go over it and then back, over, back, over, back. So back and forth and back and forth until I locate the center where it's the deepest and the loudest tone. So when you get good at this, you can just do this by ear. A lot of people like to use a scope or a, you know, VTVM in line with the speaker, something like we did with the IF alignment, but for this, it's just fine. So for example, we're at 600 now. So I'll, I'll go back and forth above and below and you'll see that it's right on. So that's off, that's off, that's spot on 600 right there. So if we look back at the dial here, so that's done. So this portion of the dial alignment is done. Now the oscillator is tracking with where the needle is sitting in the dial. Now that's only one portion. Now we need to do the upper portion as well. We need to verify that this is going to track at 1500 AM. So in order to do that, I'll move you over here. Just move that off frequency so you don't have to listen to that. I'll move the signal generator up to 1500 AM, like so, okay? Now, coming back to the radio here, I'll move this up to 1500 and we should hear the tone close to 1500 somewhere. And that looks like that is very close. In fact, that's spot on. That is very surprising. With all the components and everything that have been moved on the underside of the radio, that is still spot on 1500. So either this is a factory alignment in this thing and uh, it's very resilient to part changes or somebody's done an alignment down the road or something like this to it. But um, that's uh, getting that to a lineup like that with just one end is uh, you know lottery ticket time. So usually they're at 1300 or 1700 or, you know, somewhere a ways off, but that's directly behind the mark. 
So that's very good. So if this was out of alignment, I would do the same thing, but now with the trimmer capacitor. I almost feel like I need to misalign this so that I can just show this to you. But uh, So there's a trimmer capacitor right by that coil, which I showed you. I would adjust that to make this track correctly here. Now here's the thing. If you come up to the top of the dial, you have to say you adjust 600 and then you have to adjust the top end. If you adjust the top, then you need to check the bottom again. And then once you check the bottom, if you adjust the bottom, you need to go back and forth and back and forth until there's no more adjustment needed. Because by moving the coil and moving that capacitor, you can either stretch this band out or you can shrink the band up. So that's the whole idea. That's what we're doing is we're adjusting the tracking here, trying to make the needle and the oscillator track with what's written on the dial. An amazing amount of time goes into, you know, making something like this. And then, of course, just think about that over all of these years and even a component change, you know, it's still tracking very, very well. So this is a really uh, uh, good example of good mica capacitors in the oscillator section. Those are fantastic mica caps. So for the fun of it, let's check to see what the alignment is like at 900 a.m. So I'll move you up here. I'll uh, just move that off, Rick, so you don't need to listen to that. And uh, we'll go to 900. So there's 900 there. So let's see how close it is, just for the fun of it, at 900. Well, that's so incredibly close. That's um, it's just a touch below that little red arrow. That is fantastic dial accuracy for this radio right here. So I'm very pleased with that. So now what I'm going to do is align the other dials. It's basically the same thing that you saw me do here. I just got to go back and forth between the coil and the capacitor for each band and get that all aligned up. And then once that's done, we'll take a listen to the shortwave band and the amber broadcast band and see how well this old radio performs. That should be a lot of fun. Already, I can tell you, it's very sensitive on the AM broadcast band, so it should be kind of fun to listen to the shortwave bands as well. The moment of truth has arrived. Let's see how well this newly restored radio from 1939 performs. This is about as close as we're going to get to its performance when it rolled off the factory line way back when. So right now it's late in the evening and we're going to listen to the AM broadcast band so there should be a lot of DX in there or distant stations just due to the atmospheric conditions. So let's take a listen and see what this radio receiver is going to pull in. So I'll just turn up the volume here and we'll start scanning the AM broadcast band. Here we go. Cost. It's not, it's not, it's, it doesn't, not, it, nothing's happened. Okay, you the listener, I mean, I know some of you are thinking, okay, that's me. Well, that's well, all that's that's specifically for your strata or commercial property, ensuring both residents and first responders have the information they require. The he promised that he would eat broccoli when we crossed 4,000 subscribers on Lather it in olive oil, but I did cover it with a healthy coating of olive oil. So it's it, cold. It is cold. Are you sure you don't want to put more salt and pepper on it? A lot of red wine. Yes, some at the gate. And he reportedly had 15. That's one five. We're crews and late closures until 5 a.m. I'm Jay Phillips, Northwest News Radio. And most of your sponsors are North American. Most of your fans are North American. Then all of a sudden you sign Otani and these big money. Jesse Kelly's Burger Shop will suffer for that potential. Now, this has been a new 
Vancouver's everywhere. Hello, Vancouver and Calgary. I'm Mackenzie Cleese. It's either profanity or something you didn't say. Jewish people rejected it. <laughs> the, the ability to... People listen to classic country. Then drive a sports car. That doesn't give you the allowance to speed every time you're on the highway. It's goes among the spot. He drops dead. Pretty fantastic AM performance. Lots and lots of AM radio stations in there. So the AM broadcast band on this radio receiver is working fantastic. Let's listen to a short wave band. Let's take a listen to the short wave band. So that's from about six megahertz here to about 18 megahertz here. There really is no point in listening to these other bands because these are just band spread portions. So 9.4 to 9.6 is, you know, right up in here. We have 11.7 to 11.9, which is right up in here on the upper band. And then we have 15.10 to 15.35, which is, you know, right up in here. Now, anything from about 10 megahertz up right now is just quiet. And that is just because of the atmospheric conditions. It all really depends on the time of the day when, you know, the certain portions of the bands come to life. And right now we're active, you know, again, from about 6 megahertz up to about 10. So we'll listen in this area here and I'll show you what I mean up here. It's just quiet. Whereas in the morning and, uh, you know, at certain portions of the day, this here will start to become active at the top end. So let's take a listen. So what I'll do is I'll just turn the volume up here. And uh, we'll start moving around. Nice strong signal at 6 megahertz there, close to. Plucked out of the pan. You'd be surprised. When people close up to, I'm standing here on film on my dock, and they'll have pictures of. So stations coming in from all over the world. Prairie English. An artist who made its mark in pop. Really strong signal there. You can see how I'm barely just moving the needle, and there's stations everywhere down in here right now. So as the night goes on, some of these stations may get a lot, lot stronger. Some of the strong ones might get weak, and the other ones will get stronger. It just depends on the time of the day and how the atmospheric conditions change. It's kind of the neat thing about shortwave DX listening. You can hear I'm sweeping back and forth across to narrow in, much like the way I'm tuning the radio from the backside, as you saw earlier. So I'll sweep, I'll hear it, and I'll sweep back and forth and then narrow into the signal. Nice strong signal there. Again, signals from all over the world.
And it's going to get very quiet now again. Just because of the band. And as you can hear, it's just quiet up here. So usually I scan like this in a large area and you'll hear it if something's there, right? And then you can narrow into it. So it just allows you to sweep a larger area and see if a station's there. And that's why you see me doing this. So all in all, the shortwave performance is very good from, you know, a, or for a radio from 1939. Very impressive. Of course, this is about the best that it's going to get with all these new components, fresh tubes. And uh, this is attached to the 369 antenna, which is outside. So very good performance. I'm extremely happy. This thing is listening to signals from all over the world. Again, at a different point of the day, I will listen to the upper portions of the band here and see how much action is up in this area. So that should be a lot of fun. So all in all, the performance of this radio receiver is exceptional to this day. It really has great sound. And, you know, the AM broadcast band is fantastic. So much AM DX on here. So this will be a lot of fun to listen to on those cold winter nights, just sitting and scanning the band, you know, listening for little stations hiding out here, there and everywhere. So all in all, project successful. It looks great and it works great. Hey, can't ask for anything more, right? Thanks for stopping by the lab today. I hope you enjoyed this restoration as much as I did. If you are enjoying my videos, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. Don't forget to subscribe and tap that bell symbol. That way you'll be notified when I post a brand new video. There will be a lot of electronic projects, repairs, restoration, electronic troubleshooting, all sorts of great stuff on this channel involving modern electronic devices and older electronic devices alike, like you saw in this video right here. Sometimes we get right into a full restoration. Sometimes we get into just a resurrection. Sometimes it's a repair, maybe just a troubleshooting procedure and even circuitry design. It's all on this channel. So if you're all about electronics, like I'm all about electronics, this is the place that you want to be. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level, and learning electronics in a very different and effective way and gaining access to many of my personal electronic inventions and designs, many of which you've seen in this video, you're definitely going to want to check out my ongoing electronics course on Patreon. I'll put the link just below the video's description under the show more tab and I'll pin the link at the top of the comment section. So if you click on the link, it'll take you right there. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now. Some bonus footage a few hours later. We'll take a listen to the broadcast band again. And I've got things dimmed out just a little bit so you can get a better view of the iTube. So let's take a listen to the AM broadcast band. A major industry. Books on how to manage... Uh, I'm gonna... You're gonna what? I'll watch. Stop him. So, um, I don't think you gotta call more than you gotta sit down. Or do you report? For Congress, she passed. Ukraine aid is. Hey, hey. You're right. Hey, hey, hey. Disclosure through there uh, due to that to ongoing. Hey, hey, hey. The Vikings on Sunday called it embarrassing. Uh, 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 I had his family to play in the silver and black, and it was the worst possible timing. And I'm not saying the staying with the Packers would have been any better, though the Packers might not have ended the way they did the Aaron Rodgers era if Devontae still been there. Let me...
game was set to pick them up, right? Because the other one couldn't continue on. But when that plane landed in Goose Bay... Island I-5 from Spokane Street up to I-90. One right lane is closed overnight until 5 a.m. for construction work. I'm Jay Phillips, Northwest News Radio. I'm through it. Um, I found after five years, it's certainly more manageable. Do one point. Point opposite. Showers in the morning, clearing in the afternoon, a high of eight. Friday, mainly cloudy. I don't think it says. I don't think it was. And have the expertise and experience to help you. One easy call to Optima can start the process.